Good afternoon and welcome to uh, Columbia's World Leaders Forum. I'm John Coatsworth, Provost of the University, and I'm honored to welcome Andrei Brinkovich, Prime Minister of the Republic of Croatia, for a talk on a very timely topic, the future of Europe, a Croatian perspective. I would also like to acknowledge the presence with us today of Mr. Pierre Simonovic, Ambassador of the Republic of Croatia to the United States, <coughs> as well as the other members of the President's delegation. I would also like to thank Colombia's Global Policy Initiative for co-sponsoring this event and acknowledge the presence of its director, University Professor Michael Doyle. Croatia is at a pivotal point in its development. In 2013, it achieved a long sought after goal. The nation became the newest member of the European Union. Prime Minister Plankovic's career has placed him at the very center of this transition and makes him uniquely able to explain the meaning of these events. His background as a student activist dating back to Croatia's declaration of independence from Yugoslavia in 1991 along with his subsequent experience as a diplomat and policymaker, give him the necessary background and experience and knowledge uh, to help, as he did, negotiate Croatia's accession to the European Union, bring those negotiations to a conclusion as Croatia's State Secretary for European Integration, and then campaign to generate public support within Croatia for membership in the, in the European Union by explaining the process of accession and the value of becoming part of the Union. Mr. Plenković served as a member of the Croatian Parliament and as one of the nation's representatives to the European Union, and then last year was chosen by the governing coalition to head Croatia as its prime minister. For the first time since the global recession, Croatia is experiencing sustained, if modest, economic growth. And yet, economic instability continues to cast a shadow over the nation and the region. A notable economic bright spot is the record-breaking number of tourists traveling to Croatia's Adriatic coastline, many of them attracted by the fact that Dubrovnik is the main location for the filming uh, for the location of King's Landing, the capital city of the Game, Game of Thrones. The issues confronting Prime Minister Plenković and Croatia are familiar to us and serve as a reminder that differences in geography and national history sometimes prove secondary to the power of global trends. This past summer's headlines in Croatia spoke of battles over immigration and the status of refugees, the rise of ultranationalism, an intensifying debate about tax reform and natural disasters including catastrophic flooding and dozens of wildfires. Croatia is lucky to have as its prime minister a man who is experienced and capable of responding to all of these crises at the same time. We will now hear from the Prime Minister about not navigating these challenges and learn from his expert perspective on Europe, a topic of great interest for all of us here today. Please join me in welcoming His Excellency Andrei Plenković, Prime Minister of the Republic of Croatia. Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks a lot, Rector, for this really uh, more than pertinent introduction into my speech. And uh, let me first of all extend my apologies for being late 15 minutes, but we had several commitments, as you can imagine, during the United Nations General Assembly, whether these are bilateral meetings or special events, but the traffic certainly has been not an ally, so to say, in the last few days. Uh, I would like to speak to you at, here at the Columbia University at this forum where some of my predecessors have spoken as well about Croatian perspective on the future of the European Union. You will know that we have been a member only for four years and three months and that we joined the Union when some, where some of the scholars told us just before we're joining, like, 
you're as if you are entering into a party very late at night, early hours when people are already a little bit tipsy and leaving home. <laughs> this, was, this was a comment by actually Niall Ferguson when I spoke to him when he was in Croatia a couple of years ago and um, uh, a few years later we're in and his own country is actually um, on the way out. So this is a bit of a paradox as you could see. A uh, few months ago in Rome, uh, we uh, all celebrated the 60th anniversary of the European Union. It should have been really a moment of new enthusiasm, new encouragement, and uh, reinvigorating the spirit of the founding fathers who signed the Rome Treaty in 1957. This was also a moment to try and embrace the Rome Agenda and the Rome Declaration and remind ourselves of the values that the Union is actually built on. And these values are indeed peace, democracy, freedom, rule of law, market economy. I would say that even today, with all the difficulties that we observe around the globe, are similar to the European Union just they, as they are for the rest of the world. Indeed, these internal challenges and global challenges in the altered world of communication, where everybody is communicating with everyone instantly, sometimes with arguments, often without arguments, is creating a job for those who run the European organization and the European Union and more demanding than it was ever before. The European Commission, who has this role of being not only a guardian of the treaties, but the initiator of further integration, has come up with several scenarios in their paper several months ago. And this paper and its validity is still a topic that is widely discussed in the number of member states and in the various fora of our EU institutions. You know the scenarios, whether we should carry on as we used to so far, whether the European Union should go back to the single market and nothing else, whether we should adopt a scenario where those who would like to do more actually do more, or should we do less in a more efficient manner, or should we do much more together? These five scenarios, none of them is exclusive. And uh, even in the words of the Commission President who had the State of the Union address last week in Strasbourg at the plenary session, he actually proposed the sixth scenario. I've been saying all along that we need to do a mixture of those scenarios because the optics of member states is not that much aligned as it was, let's say, 20, 25 years ago or in 2004 when we had the biggest enlargement of the group. What we need is a sense of realism and a dose of optimism for the project to succeed and for the project to be as attractive as it was before and also a model for regional organizations across the globe. This power of attraction of the Union serves as an instrument for transformation of those who would like to be the part of the club. Indeed, from uh, my point of view and my country's point of view, the two-speed Europe is a fact. It is certainly a reality. Croatia is a very clear example how it tries to become ever closer in the narrow circle of the European Union's integration. We have two steps which are ahead of us, which are two overarching processes and reforms which will strengthen our belonging to the European project. One is to join the Schengen area, as you know, an area of free movement, which has due to the refugee and migration crisis gone through a certain crisis itself because it has been an unprecedented situation that due to the changes in and war and poverty and conflicts and migration flows in the Middle East and Africa, that uh, not only border controls have been re-established among the member states, 
but it's actually uh, physical barriers and wires have been instated on some borders. Very few people would have anticipated and envisaged such a scenario in the European project where the freedom of movement was one of the not only main liberties, but one of the greatest achievements of the project. From that point of view, besides Schengen, Croatia, Croatia has another goal to attain, and that is to join the Eurozone. Europe is not anymore an a la carte project. When we wanted to join, there was not an option or an opt-out. When we signed the accession treaty back in 2011, we agreed to fulfill the criteria for Schengen, and we agreed to fulfill the criteria for the Eurozone. In a few weeks from today, we will be launching a campaign for the Eurozone accession. It is an exercise we are doing between the government and the Croatian National Bank. The general calendar in front of us is to manage to become uh, a part of the exchange rate mechanism too, sometime in 2020, and then a few years after that to become a fully-fledged member of the Eurozone. What are my, my main points for the European uh, Union process in the future? What are the three elements which I would like to see uh, strengthened or improved? First one is to strengthen the democratic legitimacy of our institutions and, the, and their efficiency. This is, I guess, some part of the failure that I will refer later on to, and that is a series of unsuccessful referenda on various EU issues in many of the member states of the EU. Second is to ensure better results of the redistributive power of the EU's budgets and the impact of our common policies on a concrete daily life of every European citizen. We need to somehow transform the abstract good into a very concrete benefit of each and every citizen of the European Union. And the third element is actually to increase the influence of the European Union on the global scene, in the global governance, including in the organizations such as the World Organization, where I have the privilege to, re to represent my country and lead the delegation here at the United Nations. For many reasons, and one of them is the rise of populism across the member states of the European Union, we somehow feel the increasing lack, on f lack of confidence in the European Union project. I became fully aware of this phenomena in 2014 during the European Parliament's elections. I think it had two features, these European Parliament's elections, despite the fact that my own political family, which is the European People's Party, and I'm the president of the Croatian Democratic Union as a member of this family, managed to win those elections to have our uh, representative as a president of the Commission, to have our representative as a president of the uh, European Council, to have our representative now as the president of the European Parliament and had all three major institutions. Nonetheless, the 2014 elections for the European Parliament were really a signal of a new phenomenon. One, in some countries, including mine, the participation was low, below the expectations, and people still didn't grasp why we should have a directly elected MEPs in a body of 751 somewhere in Strasbourg and somewhere in Brussels. Second phenomena was that relative winners in the big countries, some of them the founding members, were the, country, were the parties with the anti-European agenda. You saw it in the United Kingdom, it was UKIP. You saw it in France, it was a national front. You saw it in Spain, it was Podemos or Ciudadanos even. You saw it in Italy. It was Cinque Stelle and Beppe Grillo. You could see it also in Germany, not in a sense, not in a sense that they would be a relative winner, but for the first time ever, the Alternative für Deutschland managed to get seven seats in the European Parliament. 
not to mention the result of Pravo and Pravda in Poland, or some of the parties who have a clearly anti-European agenda in the other countries. So, in a way, the European ele elections did not only become a moment where you have the opportunity to express a protest vote against the national government or the, the moment of national politics, but also as a platform where populist parties with anti-European agenda get into the, in, into the EU institution, then they use them against the project at home. This was so plastically visible in the case of a subsequent referendum in the United Kingdom. I always said when the first time I read the speech or, of David Cameron that he was going to call uh, the end to a British-British uh, British debate uh, on the membership in the EU that it was an unnecessary uh, exercise that will not do any good to anyone. And we actually have a lose situation for him, lose situation on the long run, I believe also for his party, lose situation for the UK, lose situation for the EU, and lose situation with when we pull the line after everything, draw the line after everything, lose situation globally. Because uh, when a permanent member of the Security Council leaves the club and a country who has one of the most strongest defense forces in our club or the country who is the champion of the free trade decides to leave after a referendum which was won predominantly by manipulation of anti-European forces who use their position and the stage of the European Parliament in a way that they actually spoke about everything but very little about the truth, then we have a problem. Then democracy as such has a problem. And it is a paradox that we will have to live with, but as the French say, uh, the peuple a tranché, or vox populi, vox dei, uh, we have to find a solution. A similar example of a uh, a negative referendum on Europe was a referendum organized in 2016 in the Netherlands. The referendum which was organized by a group of, uh, I would say even provocators, who use every single European item to a little bit distract the national policy and what they picked up as an interesting issue and used the citizen initiative to organize a referendum by electronically collecting 400,000 signatures, imagine, on a referendum on the conclusion of the association agreement between Ukraine and the EU. You can, of course, imagine the span of possibilities for Ukrainians to influence the Dutch internal political debate. Possibilities zero result just enough to, to have the referendum valid, 32% which represents 0.61% of the total population of the European Union, and the referendum clearly a no. A clear no, no, we don't want to conclude an association agreement with you. What were the lessons learned of this? One, uh, very few political actors actually committed to fight for the, uh, for the idea. The mainstream parties were a bit lukewarm because they were all facing elections a year later and none of them was really properly involved. So what we had is a signal to a country who lost 10,000 people in the last three years after rebels in the country supported by Russia tried to not only to destabilize the European orientation but actually temporarily occupied part of the territory of the country and uh, annex illegally Crimea. So you send a message to a country where 10,000 people have died with European flags in Maidan, we want to join the EU, and then few provocators in the Netherlands say, oh no, 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 we don't want you. You don't, you don't even qualify for a uh, waiting room. You should be further away. Morally and ethically, extremely negative experience and I have to admit 
when we were discussing at the European Council a special uh, document which would have um, addressed the concerns of the Dutch, and when I read it, I said to, um, to fellow leaders in a very clear manner that this was going to be a document that maybe should not be that much publicized because a lot of things that we have put there as an accommodation to Dutch would not be something I'd be extremely proud of, knowing the, the, the realities of, of the country which aimed to join. So one of the elements is the rising populism, which we need to fight. I'm doing it at home constantly. We need to do it by being credible and by explaining what the European project is and what the European policies are. And from, from that point of view, the next European elections will be a serious test for the mainstream parties and this debate of those who are for or, the, or against the project will be seen uh, visibly more than ever. And uh, we all have a, a strong task to engage more forcefully in the campaign and in the debate. When it comes to the European policies, here uh, we will be now embarking on to a discussion of a next multi-annual financial framework. Basically, it's the EU budget that lasts for seven years, which is about 1% percent of the total of GDP of the European Union, so only 1 percent, and it entails around 150 billion euros a year, whether these are commitments or payments. This is actually a lot of money, even though if it's only 1 percent, and uh, the way we spend it, the way we invest in our agriculture, the way we invest in our regional development, the way we invest in our science and technology, the way we support the prevention of youth unemployment, the way we invest into science and the digital agenda, it is going to be a test whether we are successful or not, or whether the European budget really becomes as an added value to the more equal and more faster catching up of those countries who are not as developed as those who were privileged enough to be on the right side of the Iron Curtain. And that's where concrete effect of our budget and our policies, uh, especially for the countries of our size, are critical in a sense that uh, we explain that effect to the living standard of our citizens is going up because of the membership and not that it becomes some sort of an elusive category where nobody can really grasp why we join the club. Another element which is crucial from my point of view is the global role of the European Union. This is indeed um, a right moment to say it when the Secretary General of the United Nations speaks about the reform of the world organization, whether it's in development or peacekeeping or trying to address the mega trends in our globalized world in a more efficient manner after conflict or more useful and, of course, more welcome manner before the conflict in terms of prevention. Uh, the European Union can do quite a lot. It is becoming also gradually, but especially after we have absorbed the Western, Euro Western European Union, uh, it is becoming a collective defense organization. There is no real properly copy-paste uh, automatism in terms of Article 5 of the Washington Treaty, but it is certainly a direction where the project is going. So from that point of view, the Union, which has strong foreign policy of member states, should be a bit more cohesive altogether, especially in the crisis situations. Second, <coughs> it should use <coughs> its lever leverage in the defense industry in a manner where we are more compatible with each other and where our spending up to the 2% is not spent in a way where we are only fulfilling the obligations to have a basic or stationed forces, but forces which are interoperable, quick to react and complementary with other organizations. A foreign policy which would certainly draw on the large pool of the development aid that the Union is doing. We are the largest donor in the world. Actually, our 
Croatian Commissioner in this composition of the European Commission is in charge of the development policy. We should use our trade arm, which is perhaps the strongest because that's how the project started 60 years ago. We should use all other elements of our policies which have the foreign element and then in a comprehensive manner be a partner which is recognized by all other critical actors globally and a partner that really makes the difference. And I feel having been also vice chair of the European Parliament's uh, Foreign Affairs Committee that we've really gone a long way compared to where we were, let's say, 20, 25 years ago. Um, there are quite a few people, at least from the Croatian delegation here, who expected a lot by the EU back when our country was a victim of, at the time, aggression of the Serbian, Grand Serbian Milosevic regime, and when we expected the EU will somehow, with all these nice blue flags and 12 golden stars, act immediately, stop the war, help us, and everything will be okay but the tools weren't there. They simply weren't in place. A different issue, whether is there was a sufficient political will, but even if there would have been a will, the tools were not in place. Now we have the tools, we have the lessons learned, and I think we have more space to be a credible international actor where a contribution of the bigger states, medium-sized states, and the smaller states can be combined to an extent that our foreign activities are seen as a policy of a European Union that primarily stands firmly behind the values, that it has instruments and the budget to back up these values and these policies. This is how we become a relevant partner on the global scene, and this is the line that uh, my government is taking within the internal debates of the club and this is what we shall also advocate when we represent our country in the wider fora such as the UN General Assembly. I very much agree with uh, President Juncker who said Europe was not to make stand still, it should move on. Uh, Delors, one of his famous predecessors says we are like a bicycle. If we stop running the, the bicycle, we might fall. So despite all the attempts to destabilize the project, uh, regretting the Brexit, uh, we still uh, will find enough force to have this project, which I think was a peaceful continental project for the last 70 years, as strong, as attractive for even Croatian neighbors in the years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you for your thought-provoking uh, comments, uh, Mr. Prime Minister. And now I open the floor for discussion. Uh, we are having Mike uh, in the middle, and please form a line behind it. Please bring it back. Right. And uh, while the line of uh, interested to ask a question is being formed, let me break the ice uh, with the first question. Uh, you ended your presentation by saying that Europe was not made uh, to stand still. But it was also not made uh, to shrink, but to enlarge. And for the first time in history, we have a shrinking EU. So what do you think, what are the chances uh, for EU enlargement after Brexit. And uh, Croatia was particularly pushing for further enlargement of the EU to cover countries uh, of the South East Europe. Can you tell us something more about it? First of all, Ivan, thank you 
probably not very few, uh, very, very many people in the audience know that I used to be the chef de cabinet when I was 25, when Ivan was a deputy foreign minister in Croatia. So we have a long uh, history together, and I'm very happy he has been one of our highest position uh, diplomats in the system of the United Nations. Um, Andrew Duff, who is a, a British liberal, uh, who was an MEP, very experienced and very prolific in terms of writing, said that uh, for many years the European Union was devising a parking uh, position which would be something close to membership but never proper membership for Turkey and told me privately that somehow I fear if the referendum is organized that this parking lot might end up uh, being a lot for my own country. So he anticipated the shrinking several years ago. Uh, to be very uh, open, there are very few countries now who are strongly and openly advocating swift enlargements. The mood is simply not there. Uh, somehow the digestion of the enlargements of 2004, which was the 10, then 2007, Bulgaria and Romania, and eventually Croatia 2013, is still a very much of a process. The economic crisis, the perennial institutional debate, deepening, widening, the, um, I would say, crisis of the Schengen zone, at a certain point, crisis of the Eurozone, rise of the populism, rise of the extreme parties, has um, shed a bit of a fear in the mainstream of the political parties of the key member states who always drive the processes, whether we who are a bit medium or smaller size like it or not, to be the strong advocates of the enlargement. We, are the, on the other hand, since we are the, the latecomer to the club, understand the importance of the process. And uh, saying openly to countries who wish to join, uh, no way you will enter during my watch, which is five years mandate of the Commission or the Parliament, is in my view more dissuasive than encouraging. So I think we should, as a polity, be a little bit more careful in calibrating the language. There are some countries, and the closest one, uh, of course, is Montenegro, which is Croatia's neighbor, neighbor. They are doing fine. Serbia is making a lot of efforts. Some other countries of the region are doing a lot of efforts. But I still believe that any uh, swift enlargement is simply not in sight. It will be a carefully guided process based on all sorts of lessons learned of the previous enlargements, but predominantly the current mood in the publics and the key political parties of the EU. I thank you very much. I would be tempted to ask you more questions, including about Ukraine, on which you know a lot, but uh, we have a queue formed here. And I don't want to keep you waiting, so can we start with the first group of questions? Uh, before asking a question, would you kindly introduce yourself, mention an uh, institution you are uh, affiliated with? So let us start. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Prime Minister. Thank you for being here. My name is Michael Rovner. Um, I'm at the, an undergraduate at the School of General Studies here at Columbia. And I wanted to ask you, I've heard from um, some Europeans who believe that um, European Union policy is primarily driven by a few countries um, for, for their benefit, and said these said countries have special privileges within the European Union that don't extend to all the countries. So I was wondering if this is true, what can be done to change this? And if this is uh, not true, um, what can be done to combat this false perspective? Thank you. I thank you very much. Let's take uh, a couple of questions and then give a chance uh, to Prime Minister, please. And uh, knowing that, unfortunately, we do not have much time, uh, be sure. kind and ask just one question and uh, be focused and to the point, please. Sure. Um, good afternoon, Prime Minister. Uh, my name is Liu Qingyu, and I'm from China, and I am a, a School of International and Public Affairs first-year student. And my question is that uh, you seem to be a huge advocate of the integrated policy of the European Union. So do you believe a very uniform or centered policy will help your country? Because your country's situation is different from many others, like uh, Germany and France, which are highly developed. So my question is like this. Or oh, you believe a flexible approach will be better? Thank you. 
I thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister, for your very eloquent speech. Uh, my name is Edgar Elliott from so a sophomore at Columbia College. Um, and my question concerns Colombia's, um, Croatia's entry to Schengen. Mm -hmm. um, considering the EU usually demands that a nation solves any territory disputes that it may be involved in before being admitted to the body, mm -hmm. and yet there is an ongoing international territorial dispute between Slovenia and Croatia, does this necessarily prevent Croatian entry to Schengen? And if not, what sort of message does this send to other countries attempting to join Schengen with respect to the credibility of the body itself and the practical question of the exact demarcation of the border? Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Let's take uh, one last question and then uh, give the floor to Prime Minister. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister, again. Um, I am Robert Willard. I am a sophomore in the Columbia College. Uh, I had the chance this summer to pass some time in the Balkans. Unfortunately, I was in Croatia um, studying uh, migration, uh, perceptions mm -hmm. of migration and uh, the refugee crisis. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm interested, you know, there were, um, Croatia is on the route, on the way um, through Southeast Europe to countries like Germany, and um, there were some concerns over closed borders, open borders, um, mm -hmm. and what initiatives Croatia should take to accepting refugees and migrants. And, uh, I'd be interested to hear what perspectives you have on that. I thank you very much. Back to Prime Minister. <laughs> thank you, Ivan. Uh, thank you for all the four questions which you have put. The first one, whether the EU serves only a few countries or it serves the whole club. Well, uh, I deliberately, when I came to the European Parliament, wanted to join the Budget Committee. Uh, when you join the Budget Committee, then you look at the numbers. When you look at the numbers, then you can only properly see what are the real priorities of the organization, company, um, civil uh, society organization, or even university. And these numbers are uh, revealing, because out of 28 countries, 10 countries contribute to the 80% of the budget. 80% of the budget. Those who contribute a lot, of course, are those who are economically most developed or biggest by size and uh, through a very uh, developed system do finance the majority of the operations. Thus, their influence also in terms of votes in the Council is pondered by their uh, leverage in a way. But nevertheless, the smaller countries get their portion of the budget, but what we all share are the same policies. And these policies are key. Uh, Europe is a project made by law. It creates certainty, it creates predictability, it creates reliability, and it gives you an international legitimacy. And that's why even if you are bigger, medium size or small, you can profit from the project. The idea is that your institutions, the people who work on the EU dossiers, or whether it's the funding, whether it's the implementation of the acquis, whether it's part of our external policies, simply do it in the most efficient manner. Those who are more efficient get more profit. I would say that's the only rule. I wouldn't say there are those who are privileged and that the project was only intended for the few uh, of the 28. Uh, the other question was a question about the uh, flexibility, whether we are all in the same position or not. Of course we are not. Croatia is uh, doing well in terms of economic growth, uh, continuous growth of the GDP, uh, low unemployment rate, the most successful tourist season that we have had since 1990, we witness now. But in terms of economic strength, in terms of our industry, in terms of our exports, uh, in many other uh, macroeconomic indicators, we can't be really uh, compared with the countries who are far more developed and who have been in the club for a long time or who have been democracies for a long time. This is a difference. The idea is that the EU policies help us to shorten the time frame so as to catch up with those who are better developed. 
and that's how my country sees the EU policies and the EU budget and everything that we are doing. On Schengen and Slovenia, here uh, I think it's important for you to understand that the Schengen uh, does not have any uh, legal preconditions that being a part of Schengen requires solution of a border dispute. I always say that the European Union law, or the acquis, is not a substitute to the international law. Borders are very much competence of member states. Uh, it would be excellent if all borders would be solved, but I have never witnessed that the work of a Belgian Dutch Commission on the demarcation of their border, which is now uh, being active for about 100 years, has reached the table of the College of the Commissioners, the table of me at the European Council, or even any committee of the European Parliament. The point is that we should simply distinguish which are the dossiers that do have a substantial connection with the acquis and which are those that are nonetheless, even though we are, if we are all in the club, left for the member states to solve. So Croatian-Slovenian uh, border issue is one of those residual uh, elements of the dissolution of the former Yugoslavia. Our general line for last 25, six years is that the border should be established as it was on the 25th of June 1991, on the day that Croatia's parliament declared our independence. The Slovenian did the same. And the work of the two countries is to work basically on details. Uh, we went into, in 2009, after the Slovenia has blocked 14 chapters in the process of the accession negotiations, which in my view were entirely unrelated with the acquis uh, because of the open border issues, in good faith into something which was uh, basically an ad hoc arbitration where Slovenia and Croatia allocated one judge each and the three other judges with the help of the European Commission were from France, from the UK and from Germany. So despite the fact that we went into this process in good faith, um, the process was compromised due to the, co I would say, corrupt behavior between the Slovenian agent and the Slovenian judge, thus revealing the data that should have never been made known to one of the parties. And our parliament unanimously decided back in summer of 2015 to withdraw from the arbitration, and then we duly notified everyone. Uh, as a lawyer, I would have thought that the arbiters, if they are deciding on a case where one party decides to leave, uh, should have said immediately, well, what are we going to, to do? How can we continue a process where one of the parties is not participating? But they actually did continue. And this was uh, something which I would call uh, now more as a lawyer extremely unusual. As a politician, I would call it unacceptable. So they delivered an arbitration award uh, in late June this year, which established, uh, by and large, that the cadaster line, the line that Croatia was advocating all along in terms of the uh, land border, should be accepted, with some smaller exception. And then on the sea uh, delimitation, they followed another bilateral attempt of 2011 when it comes to one area of Croatian and Slovenian coast called the Savudriska Bay or Piran Bay, pending whether you're a Slovenian or a Croat. Uh, and then, of course, the line which goes out to touch the Itali Italian territorial sea. Now, the position of my government is to embark on bilateral negotiations with Slovenia, trying to address this issue and solve it. Slovenia, on the other side, on the other hand, would like to implement the award. So it will require a lot of maturity, a lot of skill, uh, both political courage and diplomatic skill to find a solution that would put behind us an issue that has, by and large, uh, unduly burdened, otherwise very good relationship that we have between Croatia and Slovenia. And on Schengen, we'll continue preparing technically, politically, uh, we will join and we will not accept uh, any uh, situations where our membership would be 
depending on solving problems which are unrelated with Schengen. On migration, you're right, Croatia was on the Eastern Mediterranean Western Balkans route, especially in 2015-2016. The estimate says that around 700,000 people passed through Croatia because predominantly their destination was either Germany or some other countries of Western Europe where the rights given to the asylum seekers, refugees or migrants were in economic or social terms far more uh, comforting than the ones in our country. But you mentioned the issue of solidarity and we as a, a member state who understands that there should be a, a burden sharing among the EU member states are willing to accept and uh, uh, basically uh, have as a host those uh, migrants or refugees which would be within the quota that Croatia due to its size and its economic strength is supposed to receive. So uh, an issue of solidarity was never questioned in Croatia and especially not in my government and may I underline that unlike some other states we never opted for a barbed wire on our borders. Thank you very much. We do not have time uh, for another full round of questions, uh, only if questions can be telegraphic and if you want to expose yourself to such a challenge that answers are very short. Okay, please be quick. Uh, we need to depart uh, in some ten minutes. Uh, so let's start, please. Fifteen minutes. Okay. Yeah, please, go ahead. Uh, my name is Carl, Carlo Dobrovic. I'm in Columbia College, a freshman. Um, in your remarks, you talked extensively about European integration and notably um, the benefits of that integration uh, experienced by ordinary citizens. To that end, I wanted to know um, what challenges or reforms domestically do you see as most pressing and how does your government uh, intend to proceed? Thank you. Okay. Well, Morning. Thank you. You were really quick. Follow the good example. Dobra večer. Uh, Prime Minister, thank you for coming to our campus this evening. My name is Dinko Franceschi. I'm an undergraduate here studying mathematics. And my question this evening is regarding the large number of educated and skilled Croatians leaving the homeland. And what is your government aiming to do both for the short term and for the long term to address this? And do you think that this is unavoidable with Croatia being in the EU? Thank you. Thank you. Dobro uh, My name is Tina Veskovic. I'm a graduate student from Croatia at the School of Applied Sciences. And I was hoping to hear your thoughts on the role of the United States uh, in the Euro future of the European Union, especially in light of the ever closer union which you were discussing, and uh, in light of the skepticism that has surfaced with the new administration in the US. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Mr. President. My name is Dominic Caramarco. I'm from the uh, SPS of Columbia, and I'm a visiting undergraduate from Germany. And I have a question regarding the introduction of the euro currency you just mentioned in your speech. Um, it is required that you lower your national debt to 60%. As of now, it is like 84% of your GDP. And I would like to ask how you try to convince the Croatian citizens um, to accept that introduction, uh, considering the me measures necessary to lower national debt. Thank you. Last question. Hello, Mr. Prime Minister. My name is Ricardo Taveras. I'm a student at the Pro School of Professional Studies as well. Um, I've heard from some Croatians that there has been some uh, efforts to black, uh, of, of blackmailing from Slovenia and uh, Hungary. And I was wondering, what was your opinion on it? Is it true? And if it is, what, what has been your uh, government's response to it? I thank you very much. Back to you, Prime Minister. Okay. Uh, well, there was a question on, on the domestic reforms. That would require another um, occasion with an entirely different subject as an introduction. But if I may say that uh, the ambition of my government is really to, after really a while, embark on serious structural reforms that Croatian society and Croatian institutions require. Uh, that would not only touch uh, 
the reform of the state administration, the reform of judiciary, the reform of our health system, our pension system, the reform of our educational system. It would require the full implementation of the document which we, which we call the National Program of Reforms, which is an annual document that we adopt normally in spring. And then through a concept called European Semester and the Annual Growth Survey, we are carefully monitored and watched by the Commission whether we are attaining these objectives. Uh, this is a task of each and every minister. This is an ambition that we all share. And this is what we have been elected for, to undertake those reforms from the period of 2016 until 2020, when Croatia will actually have for the first time the opportunity to chair and be the president of the Council of the European Union. Uh, when it came to uh, the question on the United States role uh, in the European Union's policies, we have seen, and even um, every month we see it, an evolutionary process in terms of uh, general approach to the international relations and foreign policy and multilateralism by the administration of President Trump. I said yesterday for the Croatian media that for me his speech was something that I was expecting, where he still maintained the America first and even encouraged all of us to say Croatia first or Slovenia first or Hungary first. He opened uh, his rhetorics and his uh, actions uh, more to the international organizations and to the international cooperation. This, I think, uh, was uh, a very uh, important message yesterday. We will continue dialogue. We have dia dialogue. We have a transatlantic partnership where there was a big ambition to sign the TTIP, uh, a treaty that would have created far more jobs on both sides of the Atlantic and uh, enabled us to trade much more than it was before. This is something that uh, will be a task for uh, many of the European commissioners and uh, many of the European leaders, whether speaking uh, as one or whether speaking bilaterally, bilaterally with uh, the American administration. On the euro currency, I'm very happy you are carefully observing the Maastricht criteria. There are five of them. But uh, we are lowering the public debt uh, very steadily. And there is a clear time frame how we intend to go down to 60. But you have to know that the criteria are a little bit more uh, sophisticating than just reaching the 60. The idea is the trend and the trend is really clearly recognized by uh, the European Commission that is following what we are doing, that we are going in that direction. The Croatian public knows that when we signed the accession treaty back in 2011, we already committed to become part of the Eurozone. So it is not an issue that would require another, uh, I would say, a referendum consultation of the Croatian population, because when they voted on the 22nd of January 2012, by a clear vote, 66 to 33 percent, which is a 2-1 ratio, they actually voted at that moment also that Croatia joins the Eurozone. The last question was more of a question linking what the Croat students are saying to other students if there is a blackmail uh, about the OECD membership by, by two neighboring countries. Uh, OECD is the only international organization where we could technically actually become a member. It's highly unlikely we'll ever be G7 or G20 or something like that. We lack a bit of a gabarit uh, for that type of uh, league. But the OECD is an organization which would uh, give us, I would say, uh, a final stamp that we have done everything possible in terms of transition, transformation, functioning of our institutions, credibility of our legal system, and uh, a leverage that we are part of a, a group of states across the globe 
who uh, have attained standards that those who are not in the club haven't. In 2007, the EU adopted a common position saying that those member states who are part of the club, meaning the OECD, should support those who are members of the EU but not yet members of the OECD. So instead of a blackmail, I would say that we, what we have witnessed is a violation of the common position of the 2007, uh, each country from its own perspective, one uh, trying to link the implementation of the arbitration award which for Croatia does not exist. But of course we are saying we will discuss the open bilateral issue on borders. And Hungary more linked with an issue that has to do from their optics uh, protection of their investments in the Croatian oil company called INA, which was privatized and bought by a uh, um, Hungarian oil company MOL on two, on two occasions, but there is a, a dispute. There was a one arbitration in Uncitral and the other one still um, active in Washington in front of ICSID and a series of other issues of corruption of former Croatian prime minister, former CEO of MOL. So an extremely complex issue where uh, our position is that those um, legal elements should not be mixed with the political ambition of Croatia to become a member of the OECD. And we have said it clearly. I said it in the parliament. We have uh, conveyed this message to the Hungarian side. We have conveyed this message to the Slovenian side. Uh, we've learned our lesson that the blackmailing is simply a no-go. Uh, it will not pass. It will not fly. Uh, as a member of the European Union, uh, I can play the same game whenever I would like to do that. But those are the moves uh, which you don't do to countries that have been with you standing by for centuries and will remain there. So I would uh, uh, opt for a smart diplomacy and politics rather than the blackmail. Thank you. Uh, in concluding, let me thank Prime Minister for being uh, a guest of uh, Columbia University and Global Policy Initiative. Uh, I would also uh, like uh, to say that you have uh, clearly reflected that European dream is not only good for Europe, but it's good for the world as well. So, good luck uh, to the EU, good luck to Croatia, good luck uh, to you personally in pursuing this dream. You were late, uh, but you stayed longer and answered all questions, so you do deserve I forgot one. an applause. Now, now, now I realize. <laughs> Uh, th thank you very much, Ivan, not, not to, to be a debtor to one of the students. I see there are many Croatian students who actually raised one of the critical issues, and that is the issues of many of the Croats leaving Croatia in the last couple of years. This is unfortunately a trend which is um, uh, characteristic for many of the countries of Central and Eastern Europe. Countries of greater size have far greater waves of their citizens uh, going to some other member states. If you look at the number of Polish citizens in living in UK now, you would be uh, really stunned by the numbers. I remember when I was uh, working in Paris back in 2005, there was a, uh, a referendum at the time on the constitutional treaty, and that's where the referenda started to go wrong, one in France and one in the Netherlands, and we ne never ever recovered uh, on a national level on the EU issues, so everybody now is trying to avoid any referendum, if possible, on the EU. But there was this story of the, the, of the, of the Polish plumber that all the, the plumbers in France would lose their jobs because there would be a plombier polonais uh, flying in large numbers with every charter flight from Wroclaw, Krakow, Warsaw, Gdańsk. Um, it is true, uh, quite a few Croatians in the last couple of years, not only in this year, have uh, tried to see if they can find a better job or better living in the countries of Western Europe. It is not a trend that we are happy about. 
it is a, a task, an extra task for us to create conditions where our young and our families, uh, and young families could find their job in Croatia, have a sustainable income so as to rent or eventually build or buy a house, have a proper job, form a family and stay there. Uh, this is also linked to a negative demographic trend that we have. We are unfortunately one of those nations who are literally losing people every day. And this is one of the most serious uh, tasks that my government has. It is very difficult to be a prophet whether we can stop uh, this by some sort of miraculous policies, but with all the policies that I have mentioned in terms of structural reforms and other efforts that the government is doing, if we create enough preconditions for our young to remain, then the number of those who are opting to go uh, abroad would diminish. Uh, at the same time, uh, you know, when we were selling uh, the referendum of our membership to the EU to our public, we said, this is good because you will have a chance of mobility. You would be able to spend a part of your working life or a studying period, just as many of you are now here in the U.S., studying somewhere else, acquiring an extra knowledge, coming back and bringing this and investing this into Croatian society, Croatian economy. So it is a two-way process. It is very uh, difficult to defend this, this trend when, when you see it visibly, and we see it very much in the area of uh, Slavonia. It's an area that was very much affected by war, uh, very much an agricultural part, but still the policies of my government are oriented to invest into that part of Croatia so as to uh, prevent a greater flow of uh, migration of our young and unemployed sometimes. Thanks. So I see that you are having a good time with students of Columbia University, but I also see that your entourage wants to spare you a diplomatic incident if you are late for another event. So again, thank you.